our main act for today. So our featured speaker is, as I mentioned earlier, Rachel Kiesel. Rachel is the Conservation Management Specialist for OneTAM, a collaborative of four agencies and a nonprofit on Mount Tamaulpais. Rachel leads a team in the early detection of invasive plants and other vegetation monitoring and management. And she previously worked for San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department's Natural Resources Division, as well as for her own consulting business. And today we'll be hearing Rachel present on how her team manages invasive species at the landscape scale on Mount Tam. And she'll be giving an overview of their IPM strategies and reviewing the invasion curve, as well as the process of arriving at basic protocol elements, including the species list, mapping thresholds, and treatment strategies. And her presentation will also cover widespread weed management and hygiene strategies to prioritize, is it pronounced thorough wart? containment um, and she'll review best management practices to further the prevent further spread of invasive species on Mount Tam. So I'll pass the baton to you, Rachel. Thanks, Shoba. And I just want to say it's great to be back with um, a lot of the San Francisco crew and other folks that are joining in from around the Bay Area. And I think we even have somebody from a different a different state today. So um, it's nice to be able to share this work. It is just north of San Francisco. And I learned a lot of what I do working with folks like um, Christopher Campbell and Lisa Wayne down in, in San Francisco on San Francisco Rec and Parklands. So with that, I'm gonna share a presentation here. Um, all right, so like Shoba said, this is the, the topic today, um, landscape scale invasive plant management on Mount Ham. And Shoba gave a great overview of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to start with the one TAM partnership for folks who may not be familiar, and then we'll talk about the Early Detection Rapid Response Program, often abbreviated to EDRR, and then um, some widespread weed management, because even though we put a lot of emphasis on early detection, we have a lot of weeds that have been on Mount TAM uh, for quite some time that we can't ignore. So we have to work on those as well. And then I just want to finish with a plug on best management practices and hygiene strategies, because in the end, the more of these infestations that we can prevent, um, the more cost effective and just uh, effective we are. So what is one TAM? Um, well, I kind of want to dial it back and actually say, what's Mount TAM? Um, a lot of us think about these peaks up at the that you can see from San Francisco that view looking north that iconic profile and that really for some people just feels like the mountain it's right up there at the top but the mountain has a couple of watersheds that come off of it going to the north through the Marin Municipal Water District lands out to Carson Ridge it drains off down to the west into Bolinas Lagoon it goes down to the south into um, uh, the Highway 1 corridor and uh, the bottom of that ridge at um, Coyote Valley. And it goes east over into the neighborhoods uh, where a lot of people in Marin live. Mount Tam is all the critters that live on that land. It's definitely the plants, which are typically my bailiwick. It's all the habitats that those plants make up. Mount Tam might even be the weeds. Uh, this is some uh, licorice plant or Helichrysum petiolare on the west side of Mount Tam. And it's definitely uh, the people. And we uh, really think that up at Mount Tam that um, the, when we put the collaborative together, we included a lot of the neighborhoods because it really takes the whole community, including the practitioners, to take care of a landscape like Mount Tam. So the One Tam Partnership is the four agencies that own land on Mount Tam and the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, which is the nonprofit support partner to the collaborative. So from the federal level down to the local level, we have the National Park Service with the GGNRA and Muir Woods National Monument. California State Parks, that's Mount Tam State Park. And if you don't know, Mount Tam State Park completely encircles Muir Woods National Monument. Marin County Parks has several preserves that are adjacent to Mount Tam. And the Marin Municipal Water District has about half of the land that the One Tam Collaborative focuses on um, with its large watershed that provides uh, drinking water to Marin residents. This is the area that we're uh, focusing on. That black outline is what we call our area of focus. 
We do work outside of that uh, with our partners, um, but this is kind of the core of where the work takes place. And you can see that each of the agencies that we work for also have land outside of that boundary. So we take that landscape scale approach um, and everything that we do, but we're trying to work on Mount Tam is a, it's about 40,000 acres of publicly owned open space. That black outline is also pulling in some of those beige areas, which are communities for a total landscape of 52,000 acres. But we, re we really only have domain over about 40,000. So in the, um, the that center mass with the gray, that's the Marin Municipal Water District. You can see that um, up to the north and down to the southeast, the darker green is the Marin County Parks lands, um, things that have been added sort of later in the conservation history of Marin often, um, but adjacent and still tied into that mass of Mount Tam. Mount Tam State Park is in the lightest green and that sort of um, gray green is the Golden Gate National Recreation Area and um, Muir Woods National Monument. There is a, a dark olive green up to the upper, upper left. That's GGNRA, but it's managed by Point Reyes National Seashore. So we have a lot of federal partnership that we're doing in there. So this is kind of where we work. It's all just north across the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, you can probably see Mount Tam, maybe get out your binos and see if you can see us out there surveying someday. I work in the science and stewardship sort of arm of the collaborative. We do um, as a group, a lot of inventorying and monitoring, that's plants and wildlife. There's a robust community science program. I lead the conservation management program, uh, which focuses more on that practitioner side of landscape scale um, uh, management. And then there is a, a restoration and stewardship element to the work where we can get engaged with the community to do um, volunteer and stewardship restoration. So it, when we got together as a collaborative um, around 2014, I was hired in 2015 to start that conservation management program. Um, all the partners were already managing invasive plants, just like a lot of you are. And there was some cross boundary work going on, much of which was centered around uh, Muir Woods and Mount Tam State Park because they recognize that Muir Woods is at the bottom of that watershed and everything that happens in the state park kind of rolls down. Um, the visitors are hiking through both properties, um, the plants and the animals, the water, it's all moving across the properties. It doesn't care about all those lines on the map. Um, and we needed to scale up efforts like that partnership um, in the Redwood Creek watershed, which is where Muir Woods and that, that side of Mount Tam State Park are. We needed to take that that bigger watershed scale approach or landscape scale approach um, to the new partnership area of focus. And if you're going to manage a weed like Allison has in her hands here, which is their hearts of grass, um, it's a fast mover and um, it will jump boundaries as quickly as it can. So we needed to start to take some of the information that we had, gather more information and begin to look at these weeds, not right up to a, a property line, um, but across the landscape more in a way like the weeds themselves um, spread and move. So a lot of you have probably seen this, but this is the invasion curve. Um, it works for plants, animals, pathogens. Um, we start over on the left where we have um, time is on the x-axis and on the left uh, y-axis you have the area of infestation and on the y you have control costs. Um, prevention, like I said, uh, once already is our is our best bet. So if we can prevent the spread of invasive plants coming in, then we don't have to pay anything to to manage them, and uh, the population stays at zero. Then we get into eradication. It's a it's a term in invasive plant management or invasive species management that um, we all aspire to, but can be very difficult to achieve. And early detection really falls in that late prevention and early in the eradication um, section of this invasion curve. Costs and, and the feasibility of control really go up the farther you go along in uh, time and area infested. So once we've passed that eradication window, we're moving into um, containment. I'm gonna talk about one of our containment um, approaches later in this talk. And then we all have um, the asset-based and long-term management projects that we work on. Those are for a lot of us, those are species um, that we spend a lot of time on, a lot of money on, 
and we want to make sure that new patches um, or new species that come to Mount Tam don't end up in that containment and long-term management bucket, but that we can actually get rid of them um, and move on to the next one because they do keep coming. So this invasion curve is, is very, uh, it's like a constant in invasion biology and we'll talk about it again briefly later. So in the beginning, um, when I started, there were two early detection teams working on Mount Tam. They worked on Marin County Parks lands and the National Park Service lands, but that left the state park and Marin water, which is right around two thirds of the total area that we're trying to manage, um, unsurveyed. Those two teams were using separate species lists or species lists. And so there was a need to prioritize what we would focus on as a collaborative at that landscape scale and to get the rest of those lands surveyed. We used this um, invasive, plant or spe invasive plant species early detection in the San Francisco Bay Area Network protocol as the basis for our um, uh, protocol on Mount Tam with some adjustments. And this is a document from the National Park Service. Uh, this particular document is an annual report, but you can find the protocol online. I think it's a great foundation for early detection work. And we adapted this to fit that cross boundary approach um, and to make it a little bit more manageable for the scale that we were trying to work at. So some of our partners, um, they map maybe their early detection programs may attempt to map more species than than we can really manage at that large scale. Um, Marin County Parks and the National Park Service look at some longer lists of weeds. They look at um, even lower priority weeds, weeds that they have no intention of managing um, at this time. And we really wanted to focus in and prioritize um, species that we would take management on as a collaborative. So that's an example of one of the ways that we adapted the protocol. So if we look at this map again real quick, um, you can see that there was early detection going on kind of on the margins on the, the south side and the, the northwest side, and then on the northeast and the southeast sides. But that interior core um, was unsurveyed for invasive for this early detection element of invasive plants. There was some data available from treatment work. Um, and what we find in invasive plants that is that they are often coming in from um, maybe road corridors or adjacent um, residential or private property landscapes, uh, which is a lot of what is happening on the margin. So um, in those areas that are more adjacent to uh, communities. So it was great that we had some information there, um, but we really wanted to know how things were going on across the mountain or how things were going across the mountain. So we started our early detection program um, we put the protocol together in late 2015, and then we rolled out a pilot program in 2016 with a goal of covering this whole road and trail network. That's what you're um, looking at. You're looking at the roads and trails on the um, public lands of um, the One Tam partners. So we want to cover all of that. And we want to do some of the riparian corridors. Mount Tam has a lot of drainages and little uh, tributaries and um, Creeks and drainages function a lot like uh, roads and trails. They're linear features. They have a disturbance element to them from scouring water, and it's easy for invasive plants to move along them, at least the ones that are suitable to that habitat. So that we knew that that's kind of what we wanted to be able to do is to cover all of this, um, which is ambitious. Um, in an ideal world, you know, we'd walk every inch of Mount Tam. I kind of want to do that, and then I think about the chaparral, and I'm like, yeah, maybe not. Um, but it isn't realistic anyway, so I don't have to think too hard about um, crawling through Picaringia and uh, Manzanita um, to do every inch. So we're going to focus on a sample of potential invasive plant areas based on our understanding of both how invasive plants work and um, really disturbance factors um, and, uh, on our landscape. So we focus a lot on roads and trails. Um, we do the pullouts along the roads. We do what we call non-system trails, so kind of desire lines and areas where people are beating out pathways. We pick up the trailheads in the parking lots um, when we arrive at them because those areas of repeated disturbance um, and also potential um, propagial introduction through those tires or boots or packs or um, horses, whatever it is that you're bringing in, 
Uh, those are places where populations often get started. And then we look at infrastructure and visitor use areas that we may run into um, along the way as we encounter them. So for example, um, bootjack campground or um, water tank infrastructure. So we're using the roads and trails as the sort of bread and butter of our where to survey question. But we do wanna do these riparian corridors to the extent that we can. And in the first three years, we, took, we did all the drainages that come off of um, Bolinas Ridge and um, went down every one of those, which was um, exciting, sometimes too exciting, um, but well worthwhile. And we learned a lot from that. Some of that information is, is integral to the work that we're doing now to contain thorough work. Uh, we don't have any rivers, but um, if we did, we'd want to get onto those as well. Uh, if you do any sort of riparian stuff, it just like takes five, ten times longer than it does to go down an average road or trail, um, depending on what you're trying to cover. The terrain is just much more difficult. The vegetation matrix is very complex, so it takes a while to actually look at things. Uh, when we're talking about infrastructure, uh, we really care about um, maintenance yards, green waste depots, people, you know, uh, depoting uh, any weeds that may continue to uh, grow in a compost pile, for example. Any place that people are storing rock, because as we're learning, if you bring in rock, you bring in uh, stinkwort, which is one of our priority one weeds. And we don't have any livestock, but if you've got livestock, um, look at where they stand around and beat the dirt down, because things show up there. They're also dumping a bunch of fertilizer on bare ground. Um, what weed wouldn't love that? We're, um, as we've gotten more into this work, we have started to do a more concerted effort around construction areas. Um, when we can, we like to do pre-construction surveys. So what would this ground disturbance move around? And then to come back one and uh, in years one and two after the construction, this is another time when we often pick up stink work, um, as well as other more mundane weeds. And we have a lot of fuels reduction work going on on Mount Tam in preparation for wildfire. So we've been getting into those areas after, um, you know, large mastication projects or PG&E comes in and does um, tree trimming or pole replacements. Uh, we get into those areas just to see if it's caused any new problems. You know, you're really changing the light regime, which weeds really love. So it can really change what's going on in the understory of a forest. Um, if you do this kind of work, and I'm I'm thankful that we've got really good hygiene standards on Mount Tam for contractors. And so far, there's been nothing totally crazy um, in these fuels reduction areas, at least the ones that we've surveyed so far. And again, we can't we can't get to everything. Um, the fuels reduction areas, they're they're um, wide area searches. So it's, you know, four four people on contour lines and really steep terrain. Um, trying to take a look at the whole area that's been managed, but we're managing you know, dozens and dozens of acres a year for fuels reduction. So we, we have to kind of prioritize where we think the impacts are most likely um, and head to those spots. We're also, um, we've got some stuff in place for post-fire planning in case there is a fire. We've learned from other areas in California that post-fire, um, if you had a weed infestation, it's going to pop back up. Maybe you had your broom managed really well and um, you didn't see that above ground infestation for a while. But that below ground infestation, that seed bank, um, may show itself um, vigorously after a fire. You have that nutrient pulse that goes into the soil, all of that light availability, um, weeds like um, the brooms, stinkwort, and many, many others take advantage of uh, that post-fire environment. And uh, letting the land recover from uh, fires if we want to get back native uh, species structure or function, then we're going to have to manage some of those weeds post-fire. Garrett Dickman out of NPS put this together. It's a nice um, breakdown of how to prioritize post-fire, um, of where you're going to search with your post-fire EDRR. And as you can see, the bigger the burn gets, the, the less you're going to get to. Um, so really focusing on those areas of um, potential propagule introduction. So those camps where everybody's vehicle comes in, um, those known infestations, areas where you knew you already had a problem, and areas of severe soil disturbance like dozer lines. We're lucky on TAM we haven't had to implement this yet, but we've got it in hand um, if that situation arises. And we've worked with some of our 
partners out at Point Reyes National Seashore joined some of their early detection surveys after the uh, Woodward fire, um, as well as going up and joining the Bay Area District in their Sonoma County parks uh, to see what they're doing post fire so that hopefully we're prepared um, if this situation arises on Mount Tam or perhaps when. And uh, one thing that we're expanding into that I find really joyful um, is doing early detection around our rare plant and sensitive species habitat. And I, I think this is a really, um, it's fun for the staff. It's not as dry as road and trail surveys. By the time you get into a lot of this rare plant monitoring, you've done dozens and dozens of miles on roads and trails. You've seen a lot of impacts. But a lot of our rare plant habitat is in decent shape. So you get to walk around in these really pretty areas. We can knock out um, monitoring the rare plants as well as looking for threats to them. Um, and if you have other sensitive species, like say something like a California red-legged frog, one reason to look in those areas is that if you think about invasive plant management and those long-term control projects, it's much easier on a sensitive species if you can find some, find a, um, a weed early and maybe have to do five years of follow-up that might be, you know, the last few years might be getting rid of a few individuals um, than it is to have to come back every year because a, a, a plant is beginning to impact that critter's habitat. So um, sometimes there's an impetus for finding these things early when you have maybe more treatment strategies available because the population isn't so big. Um, yeah, just, uh, and also it's fun. So this year we're focusing on um, marine dwarf flax, Hesperolinin congestum, which is uh, federally listed through the Serpentine Soils uh, Recovery Plan for the San Francisco Bay Area. We've got a lot of little populations of that species and some really gorgeous habitat where we have um, mostly invasive annual grasses that penetrate that um, harsh soil environment. So uh, goat grass, cheat grass, and um, well, I guess there's no cheatgrass out in that area where the Hesperolinin is. So it's mostly the cheatgrass and Brachypodium distachyon or purple false broom. And we're going to go look at a, a locally rare plant because rarity has, a, has its own scale, its own um, spectrum. And we have one little population of um, flannel bush or California glory, the Fremontodendron californicum over in Cascade Canyon. They've only seen a couple of plants. They're not sure if it's reproducing. Nobody's had a chance to go back. Um, and take a look at how it's doing. Is there any recruitment so we can tick that box, get a little bit more information about that species and look for any threats to it um, that may have perhaps like a competition impact on those. Um, hopefully we'll see some seedlings or young plants. So um, we're integrating that in um, as we can. So we're trying to do all of the roads and trails every three years. It's about 100 miles a year. Um, we do some routes every year because of the weeds that grow on them. So I spend a lot of time out on West Ridgecrest Boulevard, if you're familiar with that area and the Bolinas Trail. A lot of time um, out in that area because of the type of weeds, the about, amount of management that we're doing, and also because it's, it's a boundary with three of our agencies and we can actually cross those boundaries and do the work in, with that landscape scale perspective and keep an eye on those populations. So my crew becomes um, specialized in those boundary areas in particular because um, it's nice to have, you know, instead of um, three of the, those three agencies, everybody knows what's going on on their land and they know that they've done that. Um, we can kind of keep an eye on the whole thing and, and say at the end of the year or at the end of the season, say for something like um, goat grass out there, yep, it all got done or cheek grass. Um, so having some a group that is kind of keeping an eye on the on all of the populations, even though each agency is putting in their effort um, and we put in our management and surveying effort. Um, it's nice to have, you know, uh, somebody holding the bag who can cross all those boundaries and take a look at all the information. Um, and those other features like rare plant areas and riparian corridors and the fuels reduction areas um, and even the construction stuff all gets integrated into that framework of doing all the roads and trails every three years. And we're finding that that's a pretty, I think it's, I think it's a fine um, cycle, like in a fine interval um, to go back is every three years, or at least that's what we're finding so far. Uh, this is our, our AGOL map that we're using right now. The green is what we've done this year. 
the red is what is still yet to do. I think the green is like 78 miles. The red is like 98 miles and the orange is what we have to do um, next year, though um, some of these things get turned on every year as red because we have to do them again um, every year about maybe like 15 to 20 miles we repeat every year. Um, so we're coming up toward June is about the end of our road and trail survey cycle and we'll shift into the riparian work as the water levels get lower, um, as the birds wrap up their business in the shrubs and everything so we won't be disturbing them. Um, but this is this is kind of how we track it all and we're trying to get you can't see the ones that we did last year. We're in the, the second year of cycle three. So all the roads and trails have been looked at three times and probably two thirds of them have been looked at. Um, I'm sorry, all the roads have been, and trails have been looked at two times and about two thirds of them since we're almost done with the second year of cycle three, um, about two thirds have been looked at three times at this point. So we have. Um, we have to, that's kind of the where, where are you going to look? What are you doing? Um, but we also have to know what we're looking at. And we have a um, species list in two ranks. So this is um, most of our priority one species. This is kind of an old graphic. We've added a few plants that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and I hope that these are not all species that you see every day, that these feel somewhat unfamiliar or you're like, oh, geez, would I know that if I saw it? That's good because we um, we these are species that should be new to Mount Tam or the region or not even there yet. That's the point of the early detection piece. If we go out looking for, um, you know, things that are all over the place, it's not really early detection anymore, but we do have to find a balance between stuff that we've never seen or heard of um, and you know, might be coming from Southern California in 10 years and what's relevant to look for now. So we keep this, this list. I like to keep these um, under 35 species because I think we've got eight now that we've never seen on, or no, seven that we've never seen on Mount Tam and training on those can be a little difficult. This is a, a living list. We review it every two to three years. So we've got some new, um, new weeds to look out for, this woolly distaff thistle. If you spend much time in Sonoma County, it's all over the place. It's kind of, you know, noxious. It really will poke you. Doesn't look like a lot of our other um, our other thistles in terms of like a, a large stature yellow thistle. I know there's yellow star thistle and tocolote, but this guy looks real different. Um, and then uh, based on observations that y'all have made down in um, San Francisco, we've added the uh, Detrichia viscosa, cousin to our dear friend, the stinkwort, Detrichia um, oh, graviolans. Um, and then we also added Johnson grass because we were just finding a little bit of it, a little bit of it here and there, and it started coming in on some of those basically road materials when they recondition fire roads. So wanted to make sure that um, our staff are looking out for that. We're really focusing those new additions on uh, nearby threats, and we do consider taking things off our list, though we haven't taken anything off of the um, priority one list. So like I said, we've got seven species that we've never seen on Mount Tam. Um, the one on the left here is Tree of Heaven, and the one on the right is uh, Rattlebox or, or Cespania. Um, we haven't seen those, so we have to make sure that we're teaching our seasonal staff um, how to recognize um, really what's new and novel. It's a similar skill set to rare plant monitoring where you're kind of looking for um, that thing that stands out and having a, a, a concept of what, um, like a, a picture in your mind of what the landscape routinely looks like. Um, what does a regular Mount Tam look like? You know, that might include some French broom. Um, we want to notice that. We may want to map that, but um, having a, um, a culture of curiosity around these things that might be new. Because the other thing that can happen with early detection monitoring is that you stumble onto something that's not even on your list. And it's really important to have just a, um, a framework for how to deal with those and how to recognize things that are, are really uncommon that I can't take, um, you know, a seasonal who's never worked on Mount Tam. I'm, I don't have a reference site that I can take them to and say, hey, this is what this looks like. Now we're going to pull it for two days and you'll really know what it looks like. That works great for um, uh, French broom and Euphorbia oblongata and Helichrysum and all these other species, but I can't do that for these truly infrequent weeds, which is what we're really trying to focus on. 
So I'm going to talk about a few of these weeds because I know that these crews often um, have uh, a constituency that's really interested in what's new and emerging or um, what people have been working on and how they're how they're winning. And I'm happy to say that at least on the state parks land, um, we're having some great success with cheatgrass. We have some um, effective IPM strategies that involve a combination of techniques and we have um, moved that. This is a, a weed that is from the Mediterranean basin, widespread throughout much of California, particularly in um, drier environments, you know, all the way into the Great Basin. It's been a huge focus of um, of management throughout the state and actually the West. Um, and we care about it because it's um, it can actually get onto serpentine, which is surprising. It's one of the few plants that can invade serpentine barrens, uh, barrens in our landscapes. And those um, harsh environments are very dry. It's, uh, you know, the little rare plants that we have, which we start monitoring tomorrow, um, six endemic annuals on Mount Tam. Uh, they're all Bay Area endemics, but several of them are endemic to Mount Tam only. Um, this could be a competitor with that, and we really can't have that. So um, on the state parks land, uh, we have got this, um, we've taken it from, you know, over 10,000 plants in 2016 when we found it in our early detection surveys, and this year we have um, fewer than 100 plants. So that has been um, a, a project that I'm very happy with. It certainly didn't always look like that was the way it was going to go, because if you pick a fight with an annual grass, you better be in it to win it. They are not a joke. Um, but this year we're seeing some really good success. I'm hoping that those numbers hold. It was pretty good last year, but we we tweaked some things this year to have a better idea of exactly how well things were working. And um, I think the monitoring is showing that what we're doing is working. Um, goat grass, on the other hand, if you're um, familiar with goat grass, it is a bear. It's not a goat, it's a bear. Um, this species is, has proven much more difficult for us and our partners. Several of our partners are managing it not only on Mount Tam, um, but hotter interior environments like um, up in the Sonoma uh, State Parks, Sonoma County State Parks, um, and north in the Marin County Parks Preserves. And it is just a tough cookie. As you can see, we've thrown everything at it. We're out there flaming it in like January of 2021. Um, we've we had um, a contractor out this week hand pulling it in this same spot, and we'll be out hand pulling it um, at least once a week for the next several weeks, just in these same spots. And it's just a little bit trickier um, than the cheatgrass is proving. So. Um, our, we got some CDFA funds um, a couple of years. Um, if you're involved with your weed management area, we've we've been able to get some good little sources of funding for um, projects like the goat grass and also our Japanese knotweed work um, to support more um, expansive searching and then the, the routine management that we undergo. And what often happens with things like, well, it's any weed, but these grasses are particularly difficult, um, is you you think you've seen it all and then you get a little bit um uh you you don't take it seriously enough and you don't look in the suitable habitat every year or maybe you just run out of time you know COVID happens whatever um but it's really important to continue to look because even when you're um really manages managing these grasses year on year and i would say the same for a lot of the aster species um, they can be moving in places where you didn't know they were. It's funny how they can be both retracting and potentially uh, spreading. So detection is still a key factor. And we used our CDFA grants for goat grass in um, 21 and 22 to um, search adjacent areas. We found two new populations on Marin water, very small, much more manageable than some of the bigger stuff we've got. Um, and then we were also able to pay for the management. And that, that was through our partnership with the weed management area that we became aware of those funds and the applications had to go through the weed management area. Um, and then the last one that I want to dig into for now is the purple star thistle. Um, if you don't know this plant, lucky you, it is a very thorny uh, star thistle, not nearly as friendly as yellow star thistle. And I just want to point out um, in 2016, we'd have to hire contractors and spend several days out there um, on Bolinas Ridge in the grasslands managing this. And as of about 2021, most of what we find is um, 
not found, zero plants. And this is really what we're aiming for, um, uh, is to take those patches that early, be on that early side of the invasion curve, take these patches from a manageable number of plants to no plants. Um, we still go back. We will be one of the areas that we do survey every year is that West Ridgecrest Boulevard um, grasslands and the Bolinas uh, Trail, all of which um, have had these purple star infestations. You can kind of see the dots on the map. And then um, it's also where we do a lot of yellow star thistle management, which is also going pretty well. Uh, yellow star is a, you know, it's a contender. It likes to go hard. Um, so we're gonna be out there working on that for a while. Um, but we've reduced the purple star thistle by at least 96%. It's probably time for me to take another look at the end of this season, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's 98% um, at this point. So we're having a lot of really positive success on that one. So um, maybe throw it into the chat if you've worked on these weeds, if you've seen um, cheatgrass, goat grass, or purple star thistle, um, or um, if you haven't, and I'd be curious to know what people's experience with these these weeds are. Um, we're hoping that we're uh, working on things that are are not super widespread, though we know that that cheatgrass in particular is very widespread uh, throughout other parts of California. Um, you know, we can use that information. You know, where where are um, or are certain species uh, performing really well in areas outside of our region? Um, that can give us an indication that we might need to worry about them where we are, um, but hopefully we're working on things that are are not totally widespread. Um, a little bit just on our mapping, we we do use uh, Calflora's weed management uh, weed manager um, subscription service. We use uh, Trimble devices with the Calflora app downloaded on them. Um, we're a group that likes to use all the geometry types, points, lines, and polygons just based on uh, what, what makes sense for the population. And we map very finely. Um, so this is a weed, any weed, weed X, at different densities. And as long as those different densities are within 20 meters of each other, we're just going to throw a big lasso around them and call them the same thing um, or the same shape, the same patch. Um, but if they're more than 20 meters apart, we're going to go ahead and take a new record with the idea that, um, especially for some of these little cryptic things or um, patches where we, you know, we really want people to look at a high resolution, fine detail, that taking that high resolution data is going to facilitate returning uh, to treat those weeds most precisely. We actually um, sometimes use a three meter inner patch distance. Um, that's only at times for Japanese knotweed based on the um, the terrain and the vegetation matrix. So um, we believe in fine scale mapping without going driving ourselves crazy. Um, so yeah, we're in year two of cycle three. We have got mountains of data in Calflora. All of you can look at it. That's one of the cool things about using the Calflora database um, is that our, um, our partners can see each other's data. The public, our interested stakeholders can see our data. They can see, um, you know, whether or not we have detected something. Then they can see a field that says management status, and it will say managed or verified or not found. Um, there is a there is a value that's called extirpated. We're very shy about putting that on there because we know about those below ground infestations, but we expire to put the extirpated uh, name into that um, management status field over time. We've got lots of successful treatments going on. Most of our priority one species are managed, and we've taken a look at the patches of priority one species that are not managed um, and understood that, you know, causing Highway 1 to fall into the ocean because we want to dig out a particular plant is not going to fly with Caltrans, for example. There are sometimes reasons why you can't treat an invasive plant. Um, that's actually a picture of us in 2017 out on Highway 1 when the road was cl cl uh, closed because of landslides. Um, since it was closed, we took that opportunity to survey eight miles of Highway 1, and we did find some things that we think are important, but um, causing more landslides is not really, um, that that doesn't really work for Caltrans, which is fair because I, I have to drive these roads to get to and from work, so um, I get it. So we know why some of those are not managed. Um, and then we're strategizing on the priority twos, and we're really going to take some time to talk about that um, because I know a lot of us, even if we're doing our work in early detection, 
again, we still have to manage those widespread weeds because they are they're causing impacts to the land now. So um, in 20, I guess 2019 and 2020, we um, we worked on this report um, where we synthesized the early detection program on Mount Tam. Um, to that date, you know, we were um, sitting on even then mountains of data, and we knew we needed to take um, a systematic review of what we had learned to really implement those landscape scale strategies for our priority two species. It was also um, a good opportunity. It's when we realized that some of our priority one species weren't actually managed. Um, partnership takes a lot of conversation and a lot of communication to make sure that we all understand what is um, what's getting taken care of, who's taking care of it, um, who's holding the bag of weeds. Uh, so reviewing our data, it's just it's something I, I can't recommend enough um, because of the amount that we learned um, and were able to synthesize through the process of that report. And as far as our priority two species, I would imagine that a lot of these are familiar to you that. Um, you know, these are things that you work on. You know, the last one there is uh, the Genista monspecillana is the French broom. And I'm sorry for anyone who um, maybe I should have had more common names, but um, a lot of our common names are just not very loyal. So a lot of our um, documentation just relies on the species names and I switch fluidly in between them as I know most of you do as well. Um, but you can see our uh, jubata grass, all the ornamental catoni asters that you can still find in nurseries, um, the cordidarias, the acacias, the eucalyptus, that naughty um, erharta grass, tall fescue, which I can go down to true value and buy in a seed mix for my cattle or my horses because it's green in the winter and they like that. Um, so these are things that are are likely here to stay in some um, in some form. They're going to be in the landscape as a whole, uh, but we need to manage against their impacts and maybe have some local um, extirpation and um, control and containment. These are species that have exited that eradication phase on the whole, say for the region or maybe the state. Um, you could have some patch level eradication, but for um, a lot of them, depending on your environment, um, so the, you know, the jubata grasses don't grow well in hot interior climates. Um, but if you're coastal, it grows really well. Um, a lot of these are in some form here to stay. There will be repeated introductions of them and they are, they are um, control and containment species. And we have to do a lot of work on them if we want to um, keep habitat for wildlife and um, other vegetation, keep trails open, et cetera. So we were sitting on that mountain of data back in like 2019 when we decided to do this report. We had way more weeds than we could manage, um, which is my only experience in weed management is that, that you know, you need to prioritize. There's always going to be more work than you can get to. And we needed to prioritize at that landscape scale and take some of those um, lessons learned from the priority ones and the innovative work in Muir Woods and Mount Tam State Park and began to apply those strategies on that bigger scale of about 40,000 acres for some of these um, other weeds. Um, one of the things that we uh, learned, we took a look, we lumped all of our, most of our brooms, there is one other broom. Um, and we found that there was around, you know, this is just some perspective on those priority twos, there was around 4,000 acres of broom in a 40,000 acre landscape. Um, a lot of this is under management. so you may, may not see 4,000 acres of above ground infestation, um, but within a 10 year time span, which is the timestamp that we took for the data, um, there was about 4,000 gross acres of broom um, on that uh, one, within that one TAM area of focus. And um, that definitely falls into a need to prioritize because um, <clears throat> you're not gonna get to all of that. And all of our partners already had a strategy for broom. So this is not a, um, a clump of species that we decided to take on with more of our landscape scale um, collaboration. Um, there are little spots that we have to work on together, but for the most part, this, this species or this group of species has been around. The partners have been managing it for, um, in some cases, decades. 
and they have a plan. They know what they're up against. But there are other weeds that have been on the scene, maybe under management for 10 to 20 years, um, or sometimes just five, that require a little bit more um, uh, updating each other, finding out who's doing what, um, and coordination and collaboration. Our list is 40 species long, so it's actually really time consuming to get through all of those. To go through one species in our landscape scale EDRR subgroup um, or landscape scale weed management subgroup, however you want to think of it, um, it takes about two meetings that are at least 90 minutes and a lot of um, prep by my group to make sure that the conversation is framed up in a productive way that we have all the images or graphics or maps or whatever that are going to help explain the situation um, and the right people in the, the room or the Zoom room, whatever it is. So we haven't been able to go through all of the priority twos, but I am going to tell you how we decided which ones to work on first. Um, we use this tool called um, WIPIT or the Weed Heuristics Invasive Population Prioritization for Eradication Tool. Rolls right off the tongue. Um, we picked it because I like dogs and also because it's useful. Uh, this was developed by Gina Darren and um, CDFA, the Department of Food and Ag. And it's, it's a tool that's actually made for more like early detection species, species that are infrequent. But um, I know Gina and, and I said, hey, we got, we got plants for our priority one species. We know what we're doing with those real early detections. What do you think about using Whippet to help us figure out where to focus on um, the other the other species and she was like yeah give it a shot so um we did and whip it works like this it um it takes the impact of the species plus the invasion the invasiveness of the species and it mixes that with the feasibility of getting rid of it um and that feasibility of getting rid of something is just critical you know we're all um trying to be effective and if we can't actually get rid of something um not really sure why we would run down that path. So you've got to have some sort of effective treatment um, up against the biology of that plant. Um, so it looks at the impact to wildlands. So uh, what does the, the species do? How important is the place where it is? That's the site value, which has a very heavy weight within the algorithm or the equation, whatever it is. Um, and the invasiveness, so the distance to other populations of the same species. So is there a bunch of it nearby and you're just trying to do this one little spot? We've all kind of done that in our early days, I'm sure. Um, not the most effective thing. Um, how fast is it spread? And how many roads, rivers, and we don't have any mines, but um, uh, that's another potential vector point. Um, how close is it to being brought back in to that same place? And then under feasibility of eradication, it's looking at how big of a population do you have? Um, how capable is it of reproducing where it's at? Can you see that darn thing? That's done species by species and is baked into a species profile that is fed into this tool. Um, how easy is it to get to it? Is it you bought a grass on cliffs over the ocean? Because that's expensive and difficult. Um, is it um, you know above highway one where um, managing it. Sometimes we set that site site accessibility number to um, reflect like, yeah, we could get to it, but we're not allowed to. And we'll give that a high score as well. Um, and then um, control effectiveness and control costs. So um, all of that information is kind of pre-baked in and we're delivering the site value, um, all the stuff on population size and that site access. We're feeding in our roads and trails layers as well as our um, riparian corridor layers. And the tool is using um, Calypsi plant profiles and, and information on the back end to deliver those other um, variables. But there are things that WIPIT doesn't think about that we all think about as land managers. Um, the topography is not integrated. So if you're somebody who thinks in a watershed approach, the only way that this gets in is distance to um, you know, riparian corridors. But it's not really thinking like, uh, you know, does it roll downhill or is it all in the same watershed or, you know, wind even. A lot of our asters are blown on the wind and even even our harta over on the coast um, on our ridge tops. This is that's definitely something I'd love to see a tool take into account. 
And then most of us will try to treat multiple things at a site, which gives an efficiency or a cost effectiveness that is not integrated into the tool. And then it's got a limit on, um, you know, any any tool that you use is going to be limited by the data that you put in. And we don't know anything about infestations on private lands that are adjacent to us. Any areas that are unmapped, um, the tool can't do anything about that lack of data. So those are things that we just have to take into account with the results that come out. And the tool again was called the Weed Heuristics Invasive Population Prioritization for Eradication Tool. Um, and it really focuses, it's it's basically a look here um, a results um, uh, analysis that shows like, hey, look over here. Does this make sense? Because it's it's an it's a step in um, problem solving through experimentation, right? So it's it's pointing out these things. It's giving you a flag to say, ooh, this might be where you're most effective. And then you're going to have to integrate in these additional factors um, and just what you know about how feasible it is to work on a plant in that place. And on 40,000 acres, there's a lot of caveats. I remember when I worked for... Um, for Reckon Park, there were a lot of considerations. There were, um, you know, a lot of things that you had to think about, including, um, you know, aesthetics. You know, there's a, a, a wide variety, whether it's um, aesthetics or community values or um, access um, out on Mount Tam, that can be kind of a big deal. Um, all that stuff you have to look at as a land manager and no tool is gonna spit out, oh yeah, if you killed this right here, it's gonna be perfect. But this was a cool step that we took. So we took 10 years of data that we had up to 2019, um, just on our priority two species, and we had over 17,000 records. That doesn't mean 17,000 patches or populations of a plant because we map all of our our, um, uh, our treatments. So we had a lot of uh, data that went on top of each other. And if you've ever managed um, weeds GIS, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's It can be very frustrating. So we did several cuts of that data to eliminate um, erroneous data, um, data that didn't have, like if it had no information on the size of the infestation because it was a point or a line and it didn't have a radius or a buffer distance, there wasn't much we could do with it. Um, and we did quality control on literally thousands of records. It was a really good opportunity to do that quality control work um, on our data. And, um, we realized, you know, like I said in the beginning, that um, this tool with it was made for um, dispersed early detection type of species. And here we are trying to shove 17,000 records into it in a 40,000 acre area. So our data was a little bit of a square peg in a round hole, um, but we still wanted to try it. And we had to really massage our data. Um, we had to come up with a workflow that generalized our data in a way that WIPIC could really handle to make it think our, our um, widespread weeds were, were a little bit more dispersed. Um, and I'm just going to focus in on this one step where we generalize the data set through a dissolve, um, where, as I mentioned, we would, this is thoroughwort in about a 10 or 20 acre area. There are 68, I think, patches here um, individually mapped. And that's because we would you know, initially you might have just found a little bit of it or it spread or it contracted because you treated it. Um, and then every time you came back and did a treatment, you mapped what you treated, but maybe, you know, this is a drainage. I can kind of see the line. It goes from the northwest corner of that left panel down to the south central. Um, and that's what uh, Thoroughwort likes to do. And um, maybe you didn't always go up and treat at the top. Maybe you came back on another day because it was too much work. OK, well, that's a separate shape. So you end up with all of this. Um, and what we did was we set a standard uh, buffer distance of 30 meters and we buffered all of the shapes um, that we had and then eventually just dissolved them together. So you get this one thing that's closer to a population, um, but populations have definitions in biology and it's still just a patch. Um, and then this allowed us to um, to actually use whip it. It was it was a lot of work figuring this out. But if anybody ever else ever wants to do this, just contact myself or David Greenberger because um, you don't have to go through the as much of the trial and error as we did because we've kind of figured some of this out. Um, it did take us quite a while uh, to come up with that workflow, but it works. So our raw results come out with this table. 
where um, whip it gives it a score and lower is is better. So we don't really want to be going after um, these eight. Um, it's tied to each um, species in a place. And you can look at these site values and say, OK, uh, and the size and say, OK, does this line up? Does this look like it's thinking about this patch in the right place? Um, and that's what we did. And we realized that if you put all the stuff on the map, it just all looks crazy. Um, so we had to go species by species. And um, if you ever want to look at this report, if you want to know what's going on with some of these weeds, any of the weeds on our list, um, the report that we put out, um, you can you can Google one TAM beyond boundaries and the report will come right up and there's an appendix. Um, there are many actually. Um, and each species is linked to in the appendix. So if there's just a species that you're interested in, you can get straight to our um, review and um, landscape scale recommendations for a particular species. Um, this is another one where we actually loved the species because they behave the same way. Um, and we put the Jubata grass and the Pampas grass together. It doesn't make sense to treat them separately in this analysis, so we lump them. Um, so this is kind of what we put together. We um, have the species. The number of patches is related to the raw data that's most interesting to myself and David because it's a little bit of a gut check on how did this thing, um, how did the, the tool perform? Um, we have the populations, which is that it's it's not bio, biologically a population, but it's the dissolved um, shapes. And then um, the gross area or gross acre, these are all in acres, um, which was super interesting to know. We hadn't really done this before. And um, to understand that we have in uh, on Mount Tam about 128 gross acres of um, Jubata grass and Pampas grass combined. So that was um, that the outputs on the gross acres was very helpful in terms of um, kind of seeing what was, <clears throat> excuse me, more or less feasible. This is uh, these are what the maps look like that we um, spit out. It's got the different agencies. It's got the little um, uh, spots where the things exist. Those are all points, so none of them are um, are sized. So those points could be, you know, one square meter, which is our minimum mapping unit. It could be one Jubata grass, um, particularly on the, the north and the east side, where there's a lot less um, of these species than in the south, that coastal southwest section where we just get lots of this stuff blowing around in the coastal winds. Um, and you might be able to notice that we, pro, we sort of prescribed containment lines. Um, the hatched area is, um, it's our suggestion. So David Greenberger and I did this work together. And as a starting off point for collaborative conversations about the landscape scale management of each of these widespread weeds, we took our best analysis from using the Whippet results, what we know about the land, um, what we know about the partner's current management strategies and said, if we were gonna do something else, let's start the conversation by focusing on this area over here. Um, and um, that was what we came up with uh, for Jubata grass. I'm going to get a little bit more in depth on thoroughwort, but this is kind of what the output looks like. Um, you get the whippet scores in, in all of this, and then we also wrote up why we think um, something um, or what was our justification for our recommended treatment strategy. And that's just so we could document uh, where the conversation might start. So nothing in that is um, final. It was just a um, precursor to having in-depth and often challenging conversations about where to put our limited resources. And we went agency by agency and sometimes um, patch by patch, depending on uh, really just focusing in on the high priority areas. Um, so that's kind of what the outputs look like from the report. Um, but the species I really want to talk to you about is this um, thorough work because I'm really excited about some of the success that we're having with a containment line um, over on, again, uh, Bolinas Bridge. I spent a lot of my time over there. Um, so if you're not familiar with thorough board, um, Ageratina adenophora, it is a, um, or Crofton weed, some people call it. Um, the first time I ever saw this plant was when I lived in the Excelsior district and I went into my insanely weedy uh, new backyard and found it growing um, adjacent to this weird um, extension on the house. Um, some people think that this is pretty. 
it gets sold in nurseries, though I don't think very often anymore. Um, it's certainly not like a CDFA banned weed. Um, it could be sold in nurseries because some people think that's pretty. I spend a lot of time with it. I think it smells a little weird when I pull it, and I don't think that's pretty. It does look a little bit like bee plant. Bee plant is lovely, but no, not pretty. Um, if you want to tell it apart from bee plant, um, the easiest thing I can say is that um, all year round, every plant, the stems on Thoroughwort are 100% round, absolutely no ridges, and bee plant has, um, you know, four squared ridged stems. And even when it's little, you can kind of feel those hard veins on the stem. So um, that's how you can make sure that you're not you're not pulling bee plant. Once you get used to this plant, it doesn't look as much like bee plant. Um, so we found that we had um, about 184 acres of jubata grass, or I'm sorry, uh, thoroughwort. And what it really likes is this, um, it, it's similar to um, jubata grass in that it likes the southwest area um, of the one tam area of focus. It likes drainages. Um, it really likes drainages and seeps. It likes to keep its toes wet. And it is typically coastal um, and often in really difficult terrain in some of the drainages. Um, but it would really like to get up on the ridge tops, um, like the like West Ridgecrest Boulevard, and jump over into the interior of Mount Tam, where it will probably be confined um, just to drainages. Um, it it can grow out. We get it um, in the fog zone, out surprisingly, just like in coastal scrub, just living its best life all up in some coyote brush and poison oak, which we all you know love to get into, right? Um, so this is what the distribution looked like when we um, put the report together in 2019-2020. Um, you can see a lot of like spots where it's just going up in a line, right? It's just following a drainage. It's not in the entire forest. Um, and it, it's because it's got to live in these seeps and drainages for the most part. Once it exits the fog zone, um, it certainly has to. And it, um, it just follows those water lines. But you can see that a lot, like the whole watershed, the Marin Municipal Water District lands, there's like one occurrence that is fully managed. And I should say that about these maps. These maps are, they have no bearing on um, whether or not a, a, a population or a patch is under management. This is where this plant has been in the past 10 years or 10 years from 2009 to 2019 when we pulled the data. Um, and we're all working on those of us, any of the agencies that have thorough wart are doing some management, but no one can manage all of their thorough wart um, except for the water district, which only has that one little spot. Um, and actually, we get all the stuff in the one Tim area focus on Marin County Parks land too. Uh, but state parks and NPS, they just have a ton of it and they have to prioritize. And we needed to think about particularly the state parks land. If you look at those little dots, um, uh, the ones to the um, southwest of um, MMWD, they are um, sort of the upper extent going up to West Ridgecrest Boulevard. And we wanted to draw a containment line to keep them pushed down in the forest where maybe the wind won't blow all their seeds up and over the ridge and into drainages like Cataract Creek. Um, our partners all have different IPM um, strategies and policies. And we're going to have even more difficulty managing thorough word if it gets onto water district land. They have a lot of land, so even just surveying all those drainages would be difficult um, if it does make the jump. So we want to keep it in its place. Yes, you can live on Mount Tam, but only over there. Um, it's a challenging species because of the terrain. This is a very typical um, seep where it's popping out of the forest and it's growing in the coyote brush. You can see the white flowers here in the front of the photo. Um, this is the crew taking a break working in uh, this gnarly drainage. This is actually one of the easier ones, frankly. Um, the detectability of the plant in the forest is difficult. We have our best bet in um, April when it's flowering, but we are very busy in April and we can't just go running around in all these drainages, which as I mentioned, take a lot longer to survey than roads and trails. Um, we just we don't have the time um, to go bomb through all of them at the right time of year. So we um, we kind of rotate through them. We do a chunk and we do go look for it in the fall, even though detectability is lower. 
um, because it doesn't have the flowers. You know, if it's just that chunk of green sticking in a bunch of other chunks of green, it's harder to notice. And especially in, um, you know, drainages that have a lot of vegetation or if it's small. Um, another complication is that um, there are often, you know, if I'm trying to go out and look at this in drainages in April, I have nesting birds that I have to think about. If I'm trying to treat in April, I also have to take that into consideration. So for this project, we had to do um, nesting surveys in advance and make sure that we're doing more uh, good than harm. That's always important to us. Um, for some reason, we get so many rattlesnakes in these thoroughwort drainages on Bolinas Ridge. I got a text from one of my staff last fall. It was like September or October, and he said he was working solo, and he said, I'm getting a little uncomfortable. I just had a baby rattlesnake crawl across my hand, and when I jumped back, I almost stepped on an adult. And I just said, just get out of there. Apparently, I sent you to a snake pit. Um, and that same spot just consistently has bukus of rattlesnakes. So um, I find that disconcerting as a people manager um, and somebody who gets in there and does this work um, and is particularly uh, jumpy around rattlesnakes. It just is what it is. So we have to take a lot of precautions and, and you know open sites up so that we can really see what's going on before we put our hands or our feet anywhere. Um, this year has been a little bit better than last year. Even our contractors run into them when they do these projects. So for some reason, rattlesnakes like these spots. Um, I think in the fall because it's hot and they're trying to cool down. And maybe they have some dens around some of these and the females go back to the dens to breed and the babies might go back to them for a few months after they're born from what I understand. Um, and then there are just other, you know, other things that come up that make it difficult to achieve um, certain types of treatments in these environments. Um, so all of our partners are using integrated pest management strategies, the whole gamut, or at least some of the gamut. Um, you know, we haven't like put goats on thorough work, for example. Um, but the policies vary by agencies. We have to stick to the policies that are appropriate per agency. And if you think about it, they have different missions. You know, the water district's mis mission is to deliver clean drinking water. Um, and the other three are um, more land preservation and, and recreation focused in, in their missions. And all of them integrate biodiversity, which is uh, why we're working on these invasive plants, um, but policies vary. And we have to work within those. Um, that's where the lines on the map um, often really do matter is in policies. And that could be policies around um, what you're allowed to do on a red flag day or um, you know, anything else. And we have to keep those in mind as the, the staff who go across those boundaries. So I don't have a great map yet of um, the thorough wart line, but um, this is the ridge where we're working. You can see that um, West Ridgecrest Boulevard kind of opens up into these grasslands heading north. And what I wanted to point out is um, the, the green and the red are at the um, top of that ridge, you know, up to the Northeast, if you see that sort of Laurel Dell picnic area, Laurel Dell Trailhead and Cataract Creek, that's a lot of what we're trying to protect. We're trying to keep thorough work from jumping over into that drainage because it was creeping up to the top of this ridge line. And um, there are no dots in there yet. And we have looked, including this year, to, to make sure that nothing has jumped the line. Um, and then the tops of all these populations should be red or green. And the red is managed and the green are ones where we're not finding plants anymore because we've been doing this for about two to two and a half years now. And um, we've already got some patches to zero. And the blue, those still exist. Um, and uh, we're, that's, we had to draw a line somewhere. We can't manage all the thorough work all down these drainages. A lot of these drainages are really difficult terrain to work in. And some of those pa uh, populations are very, very dense and labor intensive. So we drew a line and we're hoping that this line works. If we need to adjust the line farther down the ridge in the future, you know, we're gonna stay committed to adaptive management um, and, um, adjust our strategies as needed, but for now we're watching to see um, with where we've got it now. Is anything jumping over um, into the cataract drainage or otherwise over onto the water district lands? And um, you know, keep some keep an eye on the the efficacy of this current approach. And this is all done with 
um, my group with state park staff, National Park Service staff, um, everybody's doing their parts and we're doing a lot of the, and actually MMWD staff have even taken some of their time to go through and make sure that um, nothing has jumped into Cataract Creek. They don't actually have anything to manage yet, um, but that detection piece is on everybody's radar. So we learned from using Whippet that it, it can be helpful for prioritizing widespread weeds. It's a, it's a great neutral tool in our partnership environment where, you know, it's, it's got this objective lens um, that has nothing to do with, um, oh, your approach doesn't work, or um, gosh, if you only had more money to throw at it, wouldn't that be great? Um, so it's nice to have a starting point that it that lacks any sort of value judgment other than the value of, of killing this thing. Um, it taught me that um, Analyzing the data early will help you find flaws in your data set. So when we had to do that quality control on all those records, it led us to implement more rigorous um, QC standards throughout the field season and to train our staff a little bit more rigorously and also to work with our partners on what we um, expect from the data. So um, that site access value is something that Marin County Parks paid to implement within Calflora. And it turned out that a lot of the partners hadn't adopted um, like filling out that variable. So then we had to figure it out um, uh, working with them to add that to all the data sets. So, hey, everybody, let's get on the same page and make sure that we're taking this information so that um, if we want to use a tool like this again in the future or this particular tool, um, it's already in there. Um, and we learned that that I think I mentioned briefly that the site value um, is the heaviest weight in the equation. Um, and what we got from the partners is, is each agency's value of the sites. And um, it is a heavy weight on the, the outputs. So it really took us knowing um, where the partners put their, um, their time and their money routinely so that we could bring that heuristics um, element into the whole analysis. So as we look forward, um, we need to have more of these really long uh, two part meetings um, about new or about other uh, widespread weeds so that we can come up with effective strategies like this containment line for thoroughwort. Um, uh, Air hearts of grass, panic belt grass is, is on my list um, because it is still spreading so rapidly as it likes to do. I just want, I want to do this one because I want to know that I don't have to worry about it in places where I wake up at night worrying about it. So this one is selfish on my part, um, but um, we, I, this is one I care about, but um, the partners really drive, the land managers really drive the partnership. So um, we're planning to get back into these discussions in the fall with the goal of looking at two more um, species this fall and to begin implementation on those strategies um, in 2024. That's the goal. Sometimes things happen. Y'all might have experienced how COVID threw a lot of goals out the window. So we're a little bit farther behind on some of this than I would have expected at this point um, in terms of you know having the conversations, but stuff happens, uh, life goes on, and we were able to keep up with our existing priorities um, out on the land. So I'm just, I'm really proud of that part. Um, finally, I think um, we've got a few more minutes of um, me talking and um, we're just going to make a quick plug for prevention. I just wanted to point out on this invasion curve that um, uh, you have uh, prevention is, is like the, the most cost effective thing. So we really want to be taking care of our best management practices for weed work. Um, with our early detection crews, we're coming into contact with uncommon weed material. And um, I have an example of one time when we did actually move it. Luckily, it was one individual and we found it the next year and it's never been back, but it can happen. So we want to, a few principles, just start clean. Everybody's shovel should shine like this in the morning and then it's gonna look terrible at lunch. And then at the end of the day, it should gleam. You could see, your, you could shave in it, right? Um, we like to work clean to weedy if we can. So um, doing the outliers first um, when we can drive, especially if we have to go off road um, or onto fire roads to travel um, from the clean areas to the weedy areas. And um, sometimes you have tasks specifically that are more dirty and um, move more soil, which moves weed seeds, which can move pathogens. 
or even tiny little mollusks in the riparian work that we do. Um, and so we try to move, um, do the cleaner tasks first. Sometimes you got to know when to call it. If the seeds are shattering out of the cheek grass, then we stop touching them. We missed the window. We can still see them, but us moving them around um, is worse than just letting them go to seed where they are. We didn't miss any cheek grass this year. Um, we like to brush between sites. This is um, actually a rare plant survey day where we detected cheek grass in a serpentine barren. We always carry stuff so that we can take bags of weeds away. We stopped. We pulled it, we brushed, we went on to another rare plant barren. Would have been a really bad idea um, to accidentally track seeds. It was pretty close to shattering, but we were able to pull it. Um, and you can see that Josh was also wearing uh, gaiters to mitigate how much junk gets stuck in his, um, his pants, his um, shoes, et cetera. We like for all of our mowers to look like this when they go site to site. Um, maybe I could even go a little bit cleaner if you gave me the right tools. We clean our vehicle as often as we uh, can. Sometimes we don't use water. We use wheel well brushes uh, with the drought. We weren't allowed to spray our trucks, so we got real handy with those wheel well brushes. We try to be reasonable. The, the rainy season is worse than the, the dry season. Not as worried about dust as we are about chunks of mud. Um, and it's really about time, giving staff time um, to do this, emphasizing that it is its value. It's value you can't add up because it's infestations that never happen. So you can't explain how important it is or how much you've saved because of it. Um, you just kind of got to believe, uh, throwing it out there. Um, BMP kits are super duper cheap. Even gators are cheap. Um, hoof picks are my favorite. I've got pretty gnarly tread on the bottom of my boots, so I got to pick them out a lot. Um, those bigger iron style brushes are great for getting a bunch of junk off. And we use the spray bottles for isopropyl alcohol. Um, we spray so our tools and our boots um, to mitigate the spread of um, pathogens, which I know a lot of people are doing, nurseries are doing. Um, we have a lot of different pathogens, particularly in that um, Phytophthora genus um, that, uh, yeah, no good. Some of them uh, are more likely to move with us than others, but um, these techniques that you use for weeds can also work for pathogens if you do something simple like integrating um, the isopropyl alcohol. You can get real exciting um, by using pressure washers, pipe cleaners, um, and wheel well brushes if you really want to take your BMPs to the next level. Um, Play Clean Go is actually having their awareness week next week, so it's a good time to promote this hygiene element. Calypsi's got some great resources on their website. Um, and with that, um, I think I'm going to stop there and 